Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to any viewers who are looking for the first time at an IFR interview. I am Stuart Pickham, the chairman of the organisation, and I'm very privileged to have with me today Professor Sir Kenneth Kalman, who is presently the Chancellor of the University of Glasgow. He began his career in medicine and became Professor of Oncology, from which he moved on to become Director of Medical Education at the University, and subsequently, by invitation of the Government, the Chief Medical Officer of Health in Scotland. That post was, was replaced by one in England, which, uh, of course, was an appointment by the British Government, and which he served for a number of years. He has also, in his career, functioned as chairman of the World Health Organisation, recently started as chairman of the National Trust for Scotland that looks after valuable parts of our heritage. Skinneth has also developed an interest in the literary side of the medical history in Scotland, and that has been published in the form of a book, and he's continuing to research in those areas. Kenneth, I'm very, very happy from school days to reacquaint ourselves and uh, um, thank you so much for coming to the conference and also for being our principal speaker this morning and for taking time to do this interview. Well, thank you very much. It's been nice meeting you again and to reminisce about the olden days. But it's been even nicer to meet the people at the conference who come from so many different backgrounds and countries and to hear their views on mm -hmm. power and sustainability. Um, this morning's lecture uh, provoked quite a, a response and reaction from various people uh, on a number of issues relating to it. But one that I would like to put to you to think about is um, the question of there is a level of awareness and a growing awareness of the current environmental crisis and what it can threaten for the future. But that this does not always seem to be matched by a willingness on, the beha on behalf of certain people to actually do anything about it. They will agree with their heads that there was a problem, but when it comes to actually changing things with the heart, it's not quite so straightforward. I wonder if you have any comments on that. Well, the first comment is I think I agree with you. Uh, and one of the points I made was that I suspect most people know that the climate is changing and that will have adverse effects. But they haven't really thought about what that means for them. It's something that will happen to somebody else. And I contrasted that, for example, in the 1950s, where we could see the dirt and the smog and the, uh, the fog and how horrible it all was. We don't see that so easily now. But what we do see is the, the drought and the heat waves, the climate change, the changes to the countryside. But I think people have still got to say to themselves, gosh, that matters to me. It matters to my children, it matters to my grandchildren. And then take action. So there are sort of two levels for that. One is the, the political people who make decisions about our future. And you and I, who may not be part of that, but actually want to change things and things for the better. You quoted this morning uh, uh, an example of the uh, case in Holland where a group of people uh, took the government to court. Um, would you like to comment on that? I found that really interesting. This was just a few days ago uh, and 886 people in Holland uh, took the government to court to say that you're not doing it fast enough and you need to do better. And the court upheld that and the government has now had to agree to do it faster and better. I think that's an interesting precedent and one which could well apply to, to other places. What it needs is people on the ground, individuals who suddenly realise this really matters to me. That's one of the reasons why I picked the public health bit as perhaps a trigger, something that said, actually, it's my health that's going to count here. And you know, the older you get, the more vulnerable you are to things like heat waves and droughts and whatever. Gosh, it matters. And actually, 25 years down the line, what will happen to my granddaughter? Will it be really bad then? So it's to try and personalise it a bit and make things change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, I, I certainly recollect the days in Glasgow when we had these incredible fogs 
smog, I don't know what they called them, but where everything was absolutely black from midday onwards, and even being sent home from school before the transport system uh, was unable to function. Um, the, during the, the course of uh, your discussion also, you related to um, the poet Robert Burns and his uh, address to a moose, and for those who are not familiar with the dialect, a mouse. Um, and particularly the, the words about uh, breaking nature's social union. I'd like to comment on that. Yeah, it's a lovely phrase, one which I've read hundreds of times, but it only fairly recently dawned on me just how opposite it was mm -hmm. to something like climate change. Here he is ploughing his field. A wee mouse runs away and he realises he's destroyed the nest and that breaks it all up. So he's broken nature's social union. Something, and, and, and the mouse is right to feel aggrieved that he, the human, has actually broken something up. And it's a very nice phrase because a lot of the evidence just now suggests that human beings are actually breaking the social union between man and nature. The, nature, the union between nature and man is being destroyed uh, simply because uh, we haven't thought about what we're doing. The, I know that there have been a lot of um, concern on the whole issue of wildlife, and that's easily publicised, the number of tigers disappearing and so on, but the way I heard you this morning, you were, you were talking about things that are much less high-profile but imminent, powerful, and invasive as influences that we're all part of, but not perhaps as aware of as we should be. Yes, that, that's absolutely right. And part of the point I was making, I've just made a moment or two ago, and that is that most of us know that there's something called climate change, which is bad going on, caused by greenhouse gases, caused by how we use our energy. But we haven't personalised it yet. Maybe that'll happen to somebody else, and it'll be a long mm -hmm. time away, and it doesn't really bother me too much. And I think trying to use stories in ways which make it real to people that nature's social union is there and we're breaking it now and it becomes irrecoverable at some point which is why the word Anthropocene is being used mm -hmm. as a way in which another great uh, thing that happened 65 million years ago when a meteor hit the earth uh, and destroyed the dinosaurs we're in the middle of another period the Anthropocene period where it's you and I and our friends who are destroying the atmosphere and in doing so, may well have catastrophic consequences. Mm. You uh, have recently been uh, working on, uh, which I think is most impressive, uh, a, a degree in uh, Master of Literature degree, dealing with uh, medical ter medical stories, and particularly with regard to Scotland. Could you uh, fill us in a little bit on where that came from and uh, where it's going? Well, where it came from was about 30 years ago when I was teaching with the Professor of Moral Philosophy an ethics class to medical students. It was a good class, enjoyed it. But we began to throw into the discussion periods bits of literature, not just Scottish literature at the time as it happens, uh, on uh, poems and plays and novels about health-related things, uh, written not by medical people but by authors whose imagination and insight often revealed things which was difficult to reveal from the distinguished professor standing up talking to people about it. Uh, and from that grew my interest in looking at literature, and I eventually focused a bit more on Scottish literature, uh, on uh, how that could influence discussions. So by presenting a group of medical students or nurses or health professionals with some bits of poetry, I said, what do you think about that? Is that real? Is that the way doctors really are? Does that matter about health? Some lovely poems, for example, about, about the environment and health, the dirt and the filth and the stunted human beings below, uh, showing that other people have thought about that too, and that's really quite important. I read a book some years ago called The Healers, which I don't know if you're familiar with it or not, but it, was, it dealt with some of the great research in... Scottish medicine in the 19th century, but it <coughs> deflated the whole thing by pointing out that Scotland at that time had the worst public health record in Europe. Um, 
obviously we cannot criticise the medical people of the day, but uh, perhaps the politicians for not recognising their role. But this link between, uh, and you've been a, a, a personal uh, leader in this field, the link between the academic medicine and public health, perhaps to close out the session you might be willing to make a comment or two on that from your experience, from your observation. Yes, I think there are, there are a couple of things that are related to that that need to be brought into it. One is, I once wrote a little book called The Potential for Health. And the thesis behind that is we already know a great deal about how we can improve health, full stop. We need more research, of course we do. We need to know more, of course we do. But right now, we know how bad cigarettes are, eating too much, not taking exercise, drugs and alcohol. We know that. But we continue to do it. And that's partly your fault and my fault. Our personal things have said, you know, well, I know that eating too much is bad, but I'm still going to. And secondly, there's a political side to that that says, we recognise that these are problems. We need to do something about it. And it's making these links. The evidence is there. The question is, how do you make it practical and change things? And I think the, the cigarette story is actually quite a good story in Scotland. Uh, banning uh, cigarettes in public places, not advertising cigarettes. That's changing things. And you can see the incidence of cigarette smoking is going down. So that's very positive. But we need to do more in other things. And part of what I was saying today was perhaps using the story a good story about it, which would make people think in a different kind of way. Well, Kenneth, thank you so much for your time and uh, your thoughts for the day. And I'm sure that anyone watching this uh, interview will be considerably enlightened by someone who has, in every sense of the term, seen it from both sides. Thanks so much for being with us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.